Greetings and welcome. We are in Junior English, and we now turn to the great feminist American author Kate Chopin. I'm with you in your hymnals on 626, 627. Now, as we turn to this text, we turn as well to make some introductory observations about feminist literature. There's a number of different ways to address and to introduce this topic. Let's talk about, in American thought, the Emancipation Project, as I sometimes will refer to it in 303. Let's go ahead and write that in our notes at level one. The Emancipation Project, that is to say, the different kinds of peoples and groups who in the history of America have got to work to find freedom, emancipation. This can either be literal freedom, as in the case of slaves being emancipated, or it can be intellectual freedom, right? Of course, we've already mentioned slavery, so we'll write that one down. So African Americans, both uh, male and female, have got to struggle to find their emancipation project. First, in terms of slavery. Second, of course, many years later, almost 100 plus years later, in terms of political uh, and economic uh, acceptance and equality. Okay? And the debate obviously rages about each one of these subgroups. The second, I've already mentioned in a prior lecture, and that is Native peoples. The Native Americans who are here struggle to find their way to some notion of equality with the especially predominantly white uh, 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 Americans who are the ones in power. We've already, uh, in earlier lectures, commented on the struggles and what reservation of land meant for these Native peoples. The third group is the one we turn to now, and that is, of course, women. Now, if you've been following our lectures and paying attention at, uh, at, to the titles in your textbook, you will notice that there is a heavy weighting of authors as being predominantly male versus female. For example, right now, if you wanted to do this and turn in your table of contents to volume one of your textbook and just ask the simple question, was the author I'm studying here male or female? And then just make a little checkbox or number how many males you've been reading versus how many females you've been reading. That list is heavily weighted to males, which begs an obvious question. I would write it down right now at level one. You have to ask this question, I think, when you come to the study of Chopin, so we'll do it. Question, where have all the females been? Where have the women been? Now, there were women in America. Yes. These women knew how to read and write. Many of them did, although formal schooling is not always going to be invited to any one of those three groups you've written down. Slaves, not allowed to read or write. Native American peoples, often not allowed to read or write. By the way, that pressure came from both sides. Not only were often white conquerors not wanting Native peoples to learn how to read or write, but the very people who were leaders and spokespeople within the tribes often said, learning how to read and write, learning how to be educated is drinking a poison from which you can never vomit it up. Once you learn things, you can't unlearn them. Therefore, no. Okay. And then, of course, now this, this emancipation of women. The question, obviously, is, though, where were the women voices all this time? I want to jump down to 3A really quickly, and I want to mention Tilly Olson's classic Silences. This is an essay called Silences at 3A. Tilly Olson, another really influential writer of the feminist epoch, and what she did is she went back and started studying critically this question. And she said, let's just talk about women writers, okay? Why is it that we have so few women writers represented? The answers that she came to were quite fascinating, and I would follow this at 3A now really quickly as you are taking a small set of notes here in the history of feminist thought in America. Olson points out in this classic essay that if you want to talk about why there are so few female voices, you have to talk about who owns the publishing houses that publishes the stuff that then people read. Now, this is a very interesting bit of research. For example, she asks, of all the publishing houses where women voices could be published, who owns those publishing houses? And the answer is, no big shock here, all of them are males. None of them are females. 
What color skin do they have? Right. Socioeconomically, where do they come from? Poor or wealthy? Right. They all seem to uh, attend the same kind of country clubs. They all seem to go to the same religious institutions predominantly. In other words, they are homogenous in their political orientation and they are the gateway to publishing. Olson makes a fascinating observation and therefore the title of her classic essay, Silences. It is not that males destroyed female voices, but rather in the publishing houses silenced them by ignoring them. Okay. In another classic essay that treats this subject from another perspective, I'm still with you at 3A, I'm still with you at 3A. We can think of Alice Walker's classic essay, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. An essay in which she contends that often females had to become artists in the one thing or two things that they could be creative in. They were expected as domesticated servants ostensibly in the home. They were expected to do the cooking, the cleaning, and the growing, we might say, both of children as well as of any kind of other kind of living things, like in the case of Alice Walker's grandma, her flowers out in front of her house. The argument that is going to be made by Walker is that women had to somehow find creative outlets wherever they could find them. And often that was not in writing that would be published. You can, for example, have evidence of writing that would be in the form of journals that will be discovered later and then published. We will find those evidences. But women, by and large, not given the rights to be able to publish. And in fact, if you're a girl of 20, 25 years old, during the turn of the century, 1900, and you say that you want to be an artist, most males will see that female as questionable and dangerous. Enter Kate Chopin. And more particularly, enter the classic short story, Story of an Hour. Let's just say it out loud. When this story is published, it is immediately considered very dangerous by male readers. Many female readers as well, but certainly male readers. Okay? Now, what is the Victorian understanding of women? I would write this down at level one. Victoria is the Queen of England during the time that we're speaking, basically the 1880s into the 1900. A Victorian understanding of women is very prevalent in America as well, especially among the moneyed class, that is to say that middle and upper class. Women are expected, when they are little girls, to grow up to become married. There is no discussion about this. Women are expected to be handed from their father to the woman's new father, new care provider. Of course, if you'll think about it, it makes sense that right now, today, if a guy and a girl get married in a religious setting, the girl will walk down the aisle and everyone will stand up. If you've been to a wedding, you know what I'm talking about. And everyone will turn and look at the girl. She is not walking with the guy who's going to marry her. The guy who's going to marry her is standing at the front. She is walking towards him. And of course, whoever is officiating the ceremony is next to that guy. She doesn't walk alone, however. Who does she walk with? For those of you that have been to a wedding, you're already mouthing it, right? Yeah, she walks with her daddy, who will bring her to the front. The religious person will ask out loud, who gives this woman away? And the father will say, I do, her father. Whoa, 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 what do you mean gives away? What is this all about? This is from an earlier time. When little girls were told from the time they were very young, someday you have to get married. And the male, dominant male in your life, your father, will give you over to the next dominant male in your life, which will be your husband. And your husband will fundamentally treat you like your father does. He will tell you what to do. He will have complete control over you, not only sexually, but also physically, uh, financially. So in other words, you got to do what he tells you to do. And then if you have a daughter, then you have to tell her the same thing. This is what, she, this is what you will do. You will grow up to be married. Okay. Now, to challenge some idea like that is going to be seen as highly, highly dangerous. Where did an idea like this even come from? 
Well, we go back in time, don't we, to that early instantiation of the Aristotelian Great Pyramid of Value. Let's put this in our notes really quickly, if we could, please. This idea that Aristotle said that when he looks at the world, he sees something kind of like this, where there, you have the gods at the top. This, by the way, is his understanding of value. The higher up you go, the greater the value. You've got men, you've got then women underneath men. Okay? Now, this is an organic view of nature and relationships. Okay? I think I've used the example maybe before in an earlier lecture. If I went out into that courtyard and started screaming at Ruthie's tree that I wanted it to become a Christmas tree, you would say, you don't understand nature. That tree can't decide. It is in its, what is it? Nature. Right? And Aristotle will use this idea that way. He will say, it is only natural that men dominate women. Okay? Because the Latin term for men is patra, patra familias. We call this the patriarchy. The patriarchy. In other words, men, patra, patra, patra familias, patra, run the world. Men decide what women will do, what they are allowed to say, what they are allowed to express, and the like. Okay? And women, what is their job? Their job is two things. Again, they will domesticate and take care of cooking and cleaning and then finally growing. They are responsible for raising of the children. Now let's be fair to Aristotle. He did say the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That's an interesting line. It may be one you want to write down. The hand that rocks the cradle, mothers, rules the world. Why? Because they're the ones who make the future men of the world, right? And so to that degree, women have tremendous power. Aristotle didn't deny that. But this was a normal instantiation for Aristotle, and are you ready for this? It was natural. To try and screw with this would either make you insane, standing out screaming at that tree, telling it to become a Christmas tree, or more importantly, dangerous. Why? Watch my whiteboard. Because when you ask why it is this way, why do women get to be told by men what to do? Why, do, why does a guy get to tell a girl what to do? Why is that, Aristotle would argue, because that's the way that God's willed it. In other words, to challenge this view makes you not a theist, but an atheist, not a believer in God. That makes you dangerous, and therefore immediately you can be punished, usually by death. Do you got me? So the suggestion that women would become equals with men for a very long time in the history of, of the world, very radical idea. In fact, on this planet, as I speak, there are millions of people who live in groups that right now, if you were to say, men run the world and women do what they're told, keep their mouths shut, men would say, you got that right. And if a woman were to say, yeah, I don't think that's fair at all, let's do this and make us equal. Right now on this planet, all over this planet, there are groups of people that would say, that is a very dangerous position that you are taking and I need you to take it back. Because this position is understood as being instantiated by God. And if you're saying that men and women should be equal, you are saying something that is against God and that for that, we will punish you. Oh, right now, today as I give this lecture, that is the case. So you can imagine that when somebody like Kate Chopin starts challenging this view, by the way, the challenge of the patriarchy, for your notes, the challenge of the patriarchy is what we call feminism. Okay? Feminism. The term itself just simply means the attack or the critique, doesn't even have to be an attack, the critique of the patriarchy. In other words, why do men get to run the show? Because that's the way God wanted it. What are you talking about? Men don't run the show because God says it's the right way. Women should be equal with men in all ways. Whoa. This is still a major talking point and debate. Kate Chopin's Story of an Hour is one of the classic first texts that kind of took the lid off, and all of a sudden you had people beginning to say things like, why can't a woman vote? Now it's interesting, you sit in a room in a state, the state of Wyoming, that is actually called, I don't know if some of you don't know this, the Equality State. 
Why do they call it the equality state? Because, at least the rumor goes, women were treated as equals and given the right to vote first in the state. Now again, that's a subject of sore debate among any number of us who study history. But be that as it may, even today there is huge debate. But we are already, of course, seeing advancements in terms of the equality and equal treatment of women by men. Of course, today now women can vote. Right, okay. There are still questions, though, about wage discrimination. A woman and a man doing the exact same job, and the man gets paid a lot more than the woman. Why is that? Often the answer is, well, because he is responsible for his family. So it's not just he, but it's also his children. So we have to pay him more. And a woman says, what are you talking about? Those children that he has, he didn't birth those. His contribution was rather small to the engagement. Those children came from women who then raised children, just like a man does. Why can't a woman get paid the same as a man? This is still a subject of huge debate, even in American culture now. Kate Chopin's story of an hour is one of the first stories to attack this patriarchal notion. I would write that down at level one. Kate Chopin's story of an hour is a classic story of feminist critique and criticism. It's still studied today and will resurrect questions of uh, critique. And we will see that now as we move forward. Before we turn to the story, though, we also want to not only see this as a political text, which I've been talking about it as such, but I want to see this as well as a powerful literary text. I'm with you right now on page 626 in your hymnal. Notice that under literary analysis, and I hope that you've written this down at 2B, you have the word irony there. Irony. Say one thing means something else. A contradiction is another way to say it. Notice your definitions. And then there are three kinds of irony that I hope that you've written down uh, in, your, in your notes. The first of those three is verbal irony. The second is situational irony. And then the third, of course, dramatic irony. Now, I know that we've talked about this in some of our prior lectures, but let's go ahead and make sure that we've got it written in our notes now. Notice, verbal irony occurs when someone says something, it makes sense, verbal, right? That deliberately contradicts what that per person actually means. Some people have called verbal irony lying. Okay? In other words, you feel one way, but you say something else. So, for example, the guy comes uh, to pick you up, um, uh, you know, and you're the girl, and, um, he, and you say, oh, I'm so excited for this date. But the reader knows, yeah, completely the opposite, right? Okay, that's, that's verbal irony. Situational irony occurs when something happens that contradicts reader's expectations. So, for example, you thought the guy was going to die, and then he doesn't die. That is situational irony, okay? In other words, the opposite of what you thought was going to happen actually happens. And the third is dramatic irony occurs when the reader or audience is aware of something that a character does not know. So the character, for example, is thoroughly convinced that he's going to live, and the audience goes, yeah, no, it ain't going to happen. Okay? That is dramatic irony. Now, as we look at this story here in a moment, we want to pay attention to Chopin's classic rendering of irony. We will ask... Is there a sense of irony? And if so, the answer, by the way, will be, yeah, that's obviously why we're setting you up. The question will then be, in what way do we have this type of irony? Okay. Now what we want to do is we want to turn to uh, page 627, 1850 to 1904. Notice her quote here, the bird that would soar above the plane of tradition and prejudice, on my whiteboard behind me, tradition and prejudice, must have strong wings, a powerful statement. The other thing I want to point out for you on 627 is that Kate Chopin's novel in 1899, The Awakening, I'd write that down at level three, um, uh, along with the Aristotelian stuff, the Tilly Olson stuff, the Alice Walker stuff, I've given you enough at 3A to think about as relational. Kate Chopin's novel, The Awakening, becomes a major controversial work simply because it does challenge in many ways fundamental understandings of the patriarchy. We think of other women writers as well. Um, Gilman is another one, the, cl the classic short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, sadly one that does not anymore appear in your anthologies. Um, we think of Virginia Woolf as another classic writer. These are writers who are early feminists, a room of one's own. It's going to be one of those classic essays that I highly recommend to you. Now let's turn to Kate Chopin's story of an hour. I'm with you on 628. We'll begin with the background information. Read it with me. The story of an hour was considered daring in the 19th century. The editors of at least two magazines refused the story because they thought it was, are you ready for this? 
immoral. Now, you're going to read this story going, immoral? What, is there like some heavy sex scene or something? No, no. When you finish reading the story, you're going to say, why would anyone think this story was immoral? Should not be published because it will promote bad behavior. They wanted, uh, they wanted Chopin to soften her female character, to make her less independent and unhappy in her marriage. Undaunted, that means she, she doesn't care. Chopin continued to deal with issues of women's growth and emancipation in her writing, advancing ideas that are widely accepted today. She is an early front runner of the feminist critique, so we want to pay homage to her in that regard. Now, we're going to look at Miss Mallard and, uh, and a very no, notice the title, Story of an Hour. This is a very short, short story. At level one, all we want to do now is just basically write down what happens. First this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Can I say it out loud to you? This is a story of three movements, three parts. I would write this down. This is a story of three movements, three parts. First something will happen, secondly something will happen, and then finally something will happen. All right. So as you read the story together now, you'll pay attention to see that. All right, here we go. Story of an hour. The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin. Knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with a heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her, as gently as possible, the news of her husband's death. It was her sister, Josephine, who told her, in broken sentences, veiled hints that revealed in half concealing. Her husband's friend, Richards, was there too, near her. It was he who had been in the newspaper office when intelligence Top of page 630. was received, with Brentley Mallard's name leading the list of killed. He had only taken the time to assure himself of its truth by a second telegram, and had hastened to forestall any less careful, less tender friend in bearing the sad message. 